Dear subscribers, as you know, we shared many information for you, and we are studying very hard to find current news for you. However, I cannot use this channel for future. Please follow our new channel called As Daily News Report and watch our video to support us. Link in description. Also, you can reach the video we shared on Daily News Report by clicking on the top right button. We highly recommend watching, subscribing and sharing. We will continue to share some news on this channel where we take precautions against some situations for future. Thank you for supporting us. Don't gel with uh, what's being observed on the ground. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, dislocations in our markets, and um, you know we are seeing we're seeing acute shortages in some areas, and we're seeing uh, the pricing of some things that are in very short supply react as the way we would expect them to, as in they go up in price when there are severe shortages. And other things uh, that are very vital to people's financial well-being, uh, when they're in very short supply, uh, the prices don't move. So that's kind of sort of where we're at. And uh, in that vein, I could uh, cite you a couple of very pertinent examples if you'd like me to share them with you. Yeah, please. Uh, you're our expert here. We've been following you and you've been on the show for years. So please uh, let us know your thoughts here. Okay. Well, I'm going to I'm going to contrast two physical markets uh, against each other. Uh, both of which are experiencing dramatic shortages. I, I would even go as far to say historic shortages. The first one I'm going to cite is the uh, market for PPE, which is personal protective equipment. And I have a, uh, somebody who is a very close to me who is in charge of procurement of PPE, specifically disposable gowns and disposable goggles for between three and 500 medical doctors who see patients on a daily basis. So procuring PPE for between three and 500 doctors uh, obviously means you'd be purchasing uh, these goods in bulk. And because it would be a requirement that fresh materials be worn uh, between uh, each each patient that's seen. So in, in the case of disposable gowns, uh, I was informed this past weekend that a disposable gown that in January was selling for 50 cents uh, in bulk are now selling for $50 each. So the market for disposable gowns has gone up 100 times in price. Uh, the price for disposable goggles was a dollar in January, and now they are thirty dollars each. So that price has gone up thirty times. And now I want to contrast, you know, the acute shortage in in the PPE market to the acute shortage that has developed recently in the silver market. Physical silver, which means not, not a futures contract, but actual bars and coins and, uh, you know, metal that you can actually hold in your hand. I happen to be very well acquainted with a, a uh, dealer of precious metal in Canada, and he may very well be the biggest dealer in Canada. And if he isn't the biggest dealer, he's certainly in the top two or three. And this person has a, a retail outlet where they sell physical metal. And they also have a wholesale division where they procure larger amounts and typically bigger, bigger unit sizes. Like instead of dealing in coins, they deal in larger bars, kilos, hundred ounce, thousand ounce silver bars. Well, what this individual was doing, uh, because there's been a, such a shortage of retail product, um, 
this this individual was purchasing or was in the a habit of purchasing thousand ounce silver bars and melting them down and recasting the silver in 10 ounce and 100 ounce bars which are more suitable for the retail trade so i was speaking with this individual on the phone a week ago and they told me that they had phoned their traditional uh, suppliers of thousand ounce silver bars the week before. So this is two weeks ago uh, when this individual tried to procure 10 1,000 ounce silver bars and could not find them anywhere. And he called wow. all the different outlets that he would normally procure them from. So the point to make here, Kerry, is that uh, one of the biggest dealers in the country cannot a- cannot access 10 1,000 ounce silver bars from anyone. And this is somebody with 30 years, uh, you know, 30 years he's in the a, trade. He's a uh, dealer. Yeah. Major, a major dealer of metal. That's insane. And cannot access 10,000 ounces of silver. So now let's let's now contrast the silver market to the PPE market and let's let's try to figure out why why the price of PPE goes up 30 or 100 times in 4 or 5 months but silver when it encounters the same kind of uh, uh unavailability the price of silver remains mired at $17 Well, ladies and gentlemen, the difference between the two markets is that silver has a derivatives complex overarching uh, the supply. Uh, So we have COMEX futures and we have LBMA futures for silver where unlimited amounts of promises of silver are sold into the marketplace, distorting the the price discovery mechanism of what should be a rising price for silver. And when one stops and thinks about this carry, uh, for, for silver to be suppressed the way it's being suppressed, in, in light of the physical shortages that have developed, uh, this can only be allowed to happen if we have complicity of the people who regulate. You see, there's, there's groups that oversee the silver market. And, and, you know, like one of the groups is like the CFTC, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission in oh, America. Very useful. They're totally useless. And the, uh, and the SEC. He probably has has a, has a you know a hand in uh, making sure that markets operate efficiently and fairly as well. Yeah. Well, let's just say they they categorically are not reflecting the the shortage physical shortage of metal and the the pricing mechanism uh, that we know as COMEX and LBMA are without a doubt defrauding people uh, which which means that this is a conspiracy actually and it, and and for this to occur this could only occur with with the complicity of government and regulators and this this is an agenda which is not publicly declared and it's an agenda to suppress the price of metal uh, to keep people from demanding hopefully on their part demanding more physical metal because these same individuals are debasing and destroying the value of the money that they issue, namely fiat fiat dollars. So I want to point this out and emphasize that we now basically have smoking gun proof. We have the comparisons. There is an agenda to suppress and keep the price of physical precious metal from rising. 
And this is being done through the ungainly uh, practice of suppression in futures markets of the price that's advertised through the uh, mainstream financial press. And so far as I'm concerned, this constitutes crimes against humanity. People are being punished for doing uh, for acting in a, a, with probity, for acting responsibly and trying to protect the purchasing power of what they've worked for. And this, this to me would, would mean that uh, people in the U.S. Treasury, U.S. financial regulators, U.S. central bankers, and it extends to the same in London, England. They're all in on These it, right? people all deserve carry to have their behinds dragged in front of the, the, the world court in The Hague, and they need to be charged with crimes against humanity. Well, that sounds this good to me. Brutal. Yeah, well, you know, the only... Uh the hallmark of freedom is free markets. When you no longer have free markets, then you no longer have freedom. And everything that we're seeing here is just a reflection of that. Let's go to the uh, pandemic here, the scamdemic. And I knew from the get go that we weren't getting the uh, straight story here, that there was no need to quarantine well people to uh, to protect the sick you quarantine the sick people and the vulnerable people uh, the reaction to it has made absolutely no sense whatsoever now one theory and i've heard uh, robert kiyosaki say it is when the repo system blew up in september there was something desperately wrong and this pandemic is cover for a reset of the system do you agree with that? I agree with it completely, and I'll take it a step further. I think that the I think that the uh, pandemic was dropped on humanity for the for the simple reason that our fiat money system is bro- critically broken, and the money that's being printed today was going to be printed whether we had a pandemic or not. Yeah. The pandemic was the was dropped on humanity as the justification for printing. Mm-hmm. If you print six trillion dollars and you don't have a good reason for doing it, it won't be tolerated by the population. But you introduce a pandemic and you 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 shutter the economy and you have people sitting at home and and they need and they need money to buy food and suddenly the creation of 6 trillion extra dollars is more than justified and welcomed by the population yeah isn't it funny how that works and uh, yeah. and this is a good thing somehow all of these uh, programs everything the government's doing is a good thing it's for our own benefit and it just seems to me that uh, that we've been totally scammed here and and uh, <laughs> just uh, i don't know where it's going to stop because with the amount of currency units that they're printing up here rob how much longer can this uh, can this scam go on fsn radio it's all about what's next Trilogy Metals is a world-class developer in Alaska's Ambler Mining District. The company already possesses 8 billion pounds of copper, 3 billion pounds of zinc, over 1 million gold equivalent ounces, and now over 77 million pounds of cobalt. Trilogy's Arctic project boasts an after-tax net present value of $1.4 billion with a 33% IRR. Trilogy is led by an experienced management team with proven success in discovering and developing projects in Alaska. The company is well capitalized, has no debt, and possesses strong institutional support. Trilogy trades on the New York and Toronto exchanges under the ticker symbol TMQ. To learn more, go to TrilogyMetals.com. That's TrilogyMetals.com. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.
Well, it's, it seems to me as uh, being illustrated by the rise in price in PPE, my, my, uh, and the rise in price in PPE has been in response to a disruption in the supply chain. Carrie, I, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I'm hearing that there are disruptions in the supply chain of food. Um, meat, meat processing uh, facilities have been closed on a more or less ad hoc basis at this point, but there's been numerous shutdowns at different points over the last few months. And my question is, what are we going to do going forward uh, if there's shortages of food and if there are shortages of, uh, let's say, uh, pharmaceuticals, because a lot of our pharmaceuticals come from China and that supply chain has been disrupted. I mean, what are we going to do if the price of penicillin goes up 50 or 100 times, Kerry? Yeah, good what question. What if a can of condensed soup costs 50 or 100 times what it currently does? Yeah. Yeah, I don't view this. I don't view this uh, escalation in prices in PPE as being uh, an isolated incident. There are other there are other goods in our uh, in the grand scheme of things in our overall supply chain that are who whose supply have been equally uh, infringed. So I look for a takeoff in prices coming to a store near you very soon. And we'll see how it plays out. But I would anticipate that this was going to spread. And I would anticipate, Carrie, that the amount of money the Federal Reserve has printed this year will be dwarfed by the amount of money that will need to be printed next year, because I do believe we're on a vertical growth curve for money. And if they don't yes. continue printing at a, at a vertical pace, the whole system will implode. Yeah, I think you are probably correct in that assessment here. So I guess you should try to buy gold and silver if you can find it. And some storable foods, not a bad idea either. Yeah. Yeah, well, I've kind of been um, planning for this since the uh, since the Great Recession, since the last financial blow up. So nothing that you're telling me uh, is surprising to me by any stretch of the imagination. But the thing that's surprising here, really, Rob, is that there are people who actually will be surprised by this. Um, I'm with you on that. And that's because we have a mainstream media that does not report the news. Yeah. And that's why people will be surprised. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, even if you're not into the quantity theory of money and all of that, you got to think that printing up uh, trillions of uh, currency units you know, within a very short period of time is going to have some kind of effect, don't you? I mean, one would think so. Yeah, one would, right? I mean, look, I don't pretend I was surprised that it didn't cause inflation before in terms of consumer prices going up, of course. But, uh, but it made sense when you looked at the mechanism they used with the excess uh, funds on deposit with the Fed, they sterilize the money. But now the money's getting going out directly. You know, it's helicopter money. It's going out directly. You know what, Gary, what I, yeah. find, what I find amazing is that a year ago or two years ago, we were talking about the inevitability of a hyperinflation at some point in time, but it was always at a distant point in yeah. time or time in the future. Well, Kerry, now it's here. The future is here. Now it's here. <laughs> the future is now. Now it's here. <laughs> yeah. Now, yeah. Now it's here. And, you know, and, and people are deal are trying to deal with it right now. And what what's even scarier, most of the public is completely oblivious that this is even occurring right now in the here and now. Yeah. 
Well, and that's disgusting. You know what? I started uh, for my kids' uh, birthdays, anniversaries, grandchild birthday, uh, Christmas. I just started giving them out uh, silver rounds, and just said, "Make sure you hold on to this. You know, it might come in very handy at some point, but do not, do not lose these, and you know, just keep them handy." And uh, Carrie, I've been doing the yeah. same thing for 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you got me beat there, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it just makes total sense. And at some point, the system is just not going to be able to sustain itself. You know, I've uh, created Lutz's uh, first law of economics, which is that uh, an unsustainable trend uh, will continue on indefinitely until, or I should say, a trend will continue on indefinitely. An economic trend will continue on indefinitely until it becomes unsustainable uh, at some point in the future, which is often unknowable. And here we are, man. You know, the whole thing is unsustainable because what are they going to do next time? Uh, Two hundred trillion dollars, a quadrillion dollars. What do they do? So going back to the repo meltdown that we had in September, that was a major tip off to anybody who was watching that something was desperately wrong and stuff was going to start happening. Uh, do you think a couple of banks or hedge funds or both failed at that point? And that's why we had that repo meltdown. I'm going to rephrase what you just said into uh, maybe a slightly different question. And my question is, uh, do you not think that we have had banks that have been uh, acting as their ongoing, uh, ongoing healthy concerns when in fact they have been insolvent and oh, yeah. I call them, I like to refer to them as the walking dead. Zombie banks. Yeah, yeah. for sure. We've, we have had zombie banks in existence in our marketplace now since the last financial crisis in 2008-9. Yes. Uh, that's my contention. And yes, they have been the walking wounded or the zombie banks for a very, very long time. Uh, but what is one to expect, Kerry, when you have uh, the, the institutions in America that I like to refer to as the Magnificent Five? Namely, that would be uh, Bank of America, Citibank, J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, and Morgan Stanley, who in the last 10 years have all sported derivatives books over $50 trillion in notional uh, at one time or the other, and there's some of them are have dropped the the amount of notional outstanding, I believe, down to forty trillion, but some of them are still over fifty, uh, namely J.P. Morgan and Bank of America, I believe, uh, and Goldman Sachs is right up there too. But but the, the the whole point is, if you think about even even if you even if you dismiss the notion just for a second that this that we're talking about notional amounts, but you know notional amounts represent bets when you're talking to Rodas. If you make fifty trillion dollars worth of bets, if you're one percent wrong on a bet of fifty trillion. Um, That's you, a lot of you money. Know, you, you, <laughs> and, you, you know, like one, one percent of fifty trillion is five hundred billion dollars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, my question to you is: there is there a bank in America that has a five hundred billion dollar market capitalization? <laughs> Perhaps uh, J.P. Morgan yeah. might be. Yeah. But uh, let's just say Goldman Sachs and uh, Morgan Stanley certainly don't have market capitalizations that large. So if they're one percent wrong on a fifty trillion dollar bet, yeah. their capital's gone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you know to to be one percent wrong on a bet of fifty trillion. Um, Frankly, as, 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 a, as a mere commoner 
who has a lifetime experience uh, in brokerage of derivatives. Um, you know, I am shocked that not one bank has ever seemingly have gotten it wrong by 1%. Isn't that amazing? In the amazing? real world, when people make bets, people are wrong, apparently, sometimes. That's why you, I mean, yeah. let's go to Vegas. Let's go to Vegas. We should go to Vegas. Just, you know, you and I carry, yeah. and we should we should see if we can run uh, fifty trillion dollars worth of bets in Vegas and never be wrong. Hey, that's why bookies uh, have bookies because uh, even though uh, the advantage is with them, but, right? Okay. But bookies get it off. wrong sometimes. Exactly. Too. Sometimes bookies lose lose. Yes. Sometimes they do. It's not very often, but sometimes they do. But we have five institutions that make the biggest bets in the world, and they've never got it wrong once. Yeah. Or so we'd be led to believe. Well, I guess they got some pretty smart people working for them there, huh? <laughs> I guess they do. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, well, I'm just trying to figure out uh, J.P. Morgan's uh, equity. But it's a, probably a couple hundred billion is what I would assume because uh, when I looked at it 10 years ago it was around 120 billion and that was after they'd been recapitalized uh, 234 billion dollars that's the common stockholders equity and then there's another 26 billion in uh, preferred stock which is technically a liability but they treat it as equity Right, so that's not so, a lot there. Not a lot and so let's just let's just hope they don't 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 get it wrong on that fifty trillion dollar book. Let's hope they don't get it wrong by one percent. Even if they're half a percent off, they have no net worth. There's no way that you can be in derivatives. And but that's okay. We yeah. we know that J.P. Morgan never loses bets. <laughs> it's impossible. Yeah. It can't happen, can it? No, it can't so, happen. <laughs> but there you go. And you know what? And we can have acute physical shortages in silver carry, mm -hmm. and the price never mm -hmm. goes up. But if we have an acute yeah. shortage of, of disposable gowns, the price goes up 100 times. Yeah. And if we have an acute shortage, uh, physical shortage of disposable goggles, the price goes up 30 times. Uh -huh. But but in silver, it appears that the, the the more short there is a physical silver, the price actually goes lower in in silver. 